Like a, what are those little bottles? Oh, the five bar energies. I need like one. Like, I'll take three. All right. Well, good morning. It is Monday, October 8th. Um, the game plan for this week, this is tentative. So today I'm going to wrap up chapter five. Tomorrow we're going to do a lab on osmosis and diffusion. And that's the tentative part. Because I'm not exactly sure if I'm going to have enough time today to prep for Herman Norcross. See, if I didn't have them, we'd do a lab because I could just come in early tomorrow morning and set it up. But I don't know if I'm going to have time during my prep today to do that. So lab, lab. So we'll spend two days in lab. But if I can't get it set up for tomorrow, then I'll just lecture chapter six, part one. And then Wednesday, Thursday will be lab. Do we have class on Wednesday? What's going on Wednesday? Is it oh, is it music? Oh, yeah. Uh, Gasp. <laughs> okay, well, then never mind. Okay, so. Well, I, I know it's October 10th. I think that's Wednesday. Yeah, yeah that is Wednesday. Okay, hold on here. I'll switch my schedule. It's okay, because then I guess I can just lecture Chapter 6 Tuesday and Wednesday, Lab Thursday, Friday, and Monday. Wow, yeah, you can. Three days of lab, because we're going to do a metabolism lab looking at fermentation, like yeast and different types of sugars. So, anyways, this unit test is Chapters 4, 5, and 6, which means you're probably looking at an exam next Tuesday. I did post the review guide on Google Classroom, but I have not had time to print it, but I will print it off when will, tomorrow. Yes. <coughs> when will the chapter five? Guided notes be due? Tomorrow. All right. Okay. Yep. Because I have to lecture part two. So. Okay. Well, stay tuned for a new schedule change. Sorry, Herman Norcross. Hang in there. Okay. Well, anyways, chapter five. Part two. Chapter five was looking at membranes, and we talked about how the structure of the bile is possible with the bile membrane set up, and how it has proteins integrated into it, um, and how these proteins can carry out different functions. Part two is going to look at how things move across. We're actually going to look at transportation of molecules in and out. And so, one way that transportation of such molecules occurs through diffusion which means that you're moving substances from regions of high concentration, that's what the brackets mean, high concentration to low concentration. There's no energy required for this. Think about just sledding down a hill. You're going down, you're enjoying the ride, there's no energy. Um, so molecules and ions always are moving in a random constant motion, but it tends to move from high to low. So if I had a beaker of water and I dropped it a drop of dye into it, I don't stir it, I just let it be. Over time, the water molecules that are moving around in that liquid will diffuse that dye and then it will just be drained. So that movement will continue until equilibrium has been reached. Um, but with the cell, there is a major barrier. We have this hydrophobic interior that repels polar molecules but not nonpolar molecules. So there's some permeability to that phospholipid bilayer. So we're going to talk about the different types of diffusion as well. We also have proteins embedded into the phospholipid bilayer. And these proteins can also be selective. It can allow important molecules that couldn't cross easily before to diffuse through the specific channel. So on Friday, you guys read some scientific articles dealing with aquaporin, um, how water and glycerol, um, another big molecule, glycerol, moving in and out through selective protein channels. So we have channel proteins with a hydrophilic interior, provides aqueous channel for those polar molecules to pass through because the phospholipid fatty tails are nonpolar. We also have carrier proteins that bind specifically, and then as a result, the protein will change shape and then just kind of um, push it on through. So we'll, we'll look at several examples of carrier proteins. Both, like I said, are selective usually, so we call it selectively permeable. So here I have a diagram showing the channel. So they just flow on through from high to low concentrations. Here are the carrier proteins where the substrate or the substance comes in and binds, and then it undergoes a conformation change and then releases it to the inside. Again, moving from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So looking at ions and how they diffuse, remember what an ion is, an atom with an unequal number of protons and electrons, so it has a charge, 
We talked about cation for positive, anion sounds like onion for negative. So because of these charges, they tend to interact very well with polar molecules, but not with nonpolar um, molecules. So again, fatty acid tails. So as a result, it needs a transport protein to help those ions diffuse across the membrane. Okay? So we call it an ion channel, which is nice. Wait, what does an ion channel do? Well, it allows ions in and out of the cell. So it has a hydrated interior. It spans the entire um, length of the phospholipid bilayer. Again, diffusion from areas of high concentration to low concentration. So if I have a bunch of ions high out here, they're going to flow in here. But then if I have high to low, it could go back out. We will look at some examples of how some channels are gated, which means that they open and close in response to a stimulus, specifically um, with your neurons. So we'll talk about how a nerve impulse is sent. Um, ions do have specific channels. We'll talk about the sodium potassium pump, and then also how it plays a role in the nervous system. So three conditions determine the direction of the movement, and the first one is the relative concentration. So where is the high concentration of the substance you're looking at, and where is the low? So from that way you can tell which way it's going to move. You always move from high to low in diffusion. Um, you're also going to look at voltage differences. Basically the membrane potential does it have the potential to undergo this conformation change. And then the state of the gate. Is it open or closed? So here I have a neuron. We're going to zoom in on the neuron. And the neuron itself is it has some voltage differences. We can see here that it's positive on the outside and negative on the inside. And when it receives a, a, a signal, a stimulus, a, you know, a message saying, hey, pass this message on to the next neuron, what happens is that we have these charges that flip. So then positive is on the inside and negative is on the outside. It's kind of like a wave where it turns into positive, and then behind it, it goes back to its original state, so it can receive another stimulus, so it's kind of doing this wave. So carrier proteins and facilitated diffusion use proteins to help transport ions or solutes or other molecules across the membranes, but it's still diffusion, so we're not using energy. Carrier proteins have to bind to the molecule that they're moving across. A lot of times it's a linear relationship, you know, as you increase the concentration of the ion, you know, the rate will also increase moving it in from high to low. If you increase the concentration carriers by facilitated diffusion, the rate will be constant until saturation. I think I have a graph on the next slide that talks about the saturation rates where you can't go any faster. Facilitated diffusion provides cell to prevent buildup of unwanted molecules within the cell. So again, with facilitated, it just means like it's helping it out. These protein channels are just helping the molecules move. It's very specific. It's usually passive, which means no energy, determined by the concentration. And then obviously it saturates. If all the carriers are being used, increasing the concentration is not going to increase the rate. So it will increase linearly until, all, until maximum capacity, we'll say, and then it will plateau off. So here, with simple diffusion, Let's just say it can just go right across the phospholipid membrane without any help of proteins, okay? Linear, increase the concentration, it's just gonna keep going up. With facilitated diffusion, we're using proteins to help the process, and so it will increase linearly for a little bit until all the channels are being used or all the, um, I'm not sure how it's protein. So facilitated system, it has proteins helping out. Mm -hmm. Right, because it can only move so many at a time. Yeah, but the diffusion doesn't have, the regular diffusion doesn't have proteins. Right, so we're just talking about moving from high to low. It will just go until it reaches equilibrium. The increased concentration and transfer rates increases. So. Okay, osmosis is another form of diffusion, but it's looking specifically at water. Okay, so water is osmosis, like those, that's it. Osmosis doesn't talk about ions or solutes. Osmosis is water. So an aqueous solution is when ions and molecules dissolve in water, and we've talked about how water is the solvent, at least I hope we have. Sometimes I get this class mixed up with biology time. Yay, yay, this, this yeah, okay. Okay, um, and the substance that is dissolved is the solute. And so when you have two regions separated by a membrane and you can't allow the solutes to pass, the solute concentration can lead.
to the movement of water. But the solutes can't because they can't pass the barrier. The water is small enough. <coughs> So actually in your lab this week, I'll say, um, you guys are going to get like these little plastic cellophane bags. And you're going to think, wait a minute, this is a plastic bag. It doesn't let things in or out. But there are things small enough. There's like microscopic pores in these bags that allow some things to leave and some things to not leave. Why is a pore a plastic bag for water? Because the water cannot drive it back into the pore. It's just like I think water. that's the condensation. But... Yeah, but you're actually going to see this happen, and you're, you'll see, I think this is the one with iodine in concentration. If not, you'll look at mass, the difference in mass. So, so it's, yeah, it's kind of cool. Anyway, so with osmosis, the movement of water from high to low. When it's, the solute concentrations are high, there's less free water, so then we call it a low water concentration. So what I mean by that is, if this is my cell, and let's just say I put it in a beaker of water, okay? Um, and it's saying the solute concentration is high. So I'm just going to put bracket S for solute concentration with an up arrow saying high concentration. So if my solute concentration is high, that means my water is low. Okay. Um, if all the solutes are on the inside, well, that means that my solute concentration out here is low, but what's my water concentration? High. High. So they kind of intermingle. So if I was looking at water, water always moves in what direction? In or to the high. To the low. Say that again. I don't know. I don't know. <laughs> to the low, to the high. What? <laughs> to the one with more solute. Right? Yes. Yep. Yeah, right. From high to low concentrations. So in this case, water will rush into the cell. And what will happen to the cell size most likely? It's going to increase. It's going to increase. And if. Explode. If. Yeah. If it, yeah, you're actually going to see some cells blow up here So in a couple of slides. Okay, now, if I were to draw the opposite. So when solute concentration is low, more free water, that means high water concentration. So same thing, beaker. Here's my cell. We're saying that the solute concentration is low, so that means my water concentration is high. Out here, we'll say the solute concentration is high, so that means my water is... Oh. Is that, so is that like what happens when they were talking about the uh, when it gets to winter and they get dehydrated, the water runs out? Um, it could be, but it's probably more because of evaporation and trans transpiration. Oh, but either way, it's because the water is getting low and not drinking yeah. as much water as it should. Yep. Okay, so then now my water, which way is water going to flow? <coughs> out. Out, yeah, but it's out of the cell. Because we're moving from high concentrations to low. So water will leave the cell. And what's going to happen to your cell? It's going to shrink. It's, it's going to shrivel. It's going to shrivel. It's going to shrink. It may die. We don't know. Um, but yeah. So that's just looking at water. So there are three different types of osmotic concentrations that you can look at. Uh, the first one's called hypertonic, which means more than. So the solution with a high concentration. Hypotonic means less than. I know it's kind of opposite. Um, solution with a lower concentration. And isotonic means equilibrium. So if I have this equal amounts of solutes inside and outside the cell, well, that means water is going to move back and forth at the same rate. So that would be an isotonic solution. Now, some ways to help you remember the difference between hypertonic and hypotonic. Hypo reminds me of a hippo. And hippos are big. <laughs> so when your cells get big, we're talking about a hypotonic solution. A lot of water. Oh, so yeah, sorry. I'm looking for the wrong thing. Hypotonic. Okay, the cell's going to get big. Hypertonic? Well, I have a little child, and she's hyper, <laughs> but she's little. Well, maybe she's not little. She's pretty tall for her age, but you know, she's little kids are hyper. Okay, so your cells are little and they're shriveling. So, so it's not actually talking about what it is. After the water rushes in, it's what it is before. No, no, no. After the movement of. Oh, well, because like the hypo starts. Oh, okay. No, no, no. Wait, hypo All right. I'm talking about the cell shape to help you remember. But yes, it's talking about the solution before. Yeah. I'm telling you the end result to help you remember. So hypertonic means that there's a lot of solute in the cell. 
Yes, yes, you're absolutely right. Yes. But, and that's before the water. That was Russians. Obviously, you yeah. had to make it easier. Wait, so Hyper gets small? Yep. And then Hyper gets big. Yeah, so there's like, it, it's all, it all kind of all depends on your perspective. So on your exam, I will be specific about what I'm talking about. Am I talking about the cell? Am I talking about the solution? <coughs> Sound good? Yeah. So the top yeah. cell, would that be um, hypotonic? Yes. Wouldn't so that be high vertical because there's a lot of cells? Okay, wait. She's talking about the cell, though. Yeah, I said the hypo. All right, never mind. I think I get her. I just got it. Okay. If you're the top cell is the hypertonic, test, but it turns hypotonic. I know. It's all about what are your top. Yeah. Well, so when they turn I on. Well, it'll turn ionic eventually, but the oh, time right, being the time. Okay, um, so this diagram is looking at water, and in this case, dissolved salt. And if this is what it looked like before, and there's this semi-permeable membrane, um, and the ions, or the dissolved salt can't move, but water can, let's just uh, examine this half. So what's my salt concentration like over here? Pretty on this high. Side? Pretty high. So that means my water is pretty low. Okay. Over here, my salt concentration. Low. And water is high. So then I should have a movement of water from high to low, right? So water will actually move across this way. And that's what you see in the second picture. The water level actually increases. So would that be like osmosis then in the oxygen? Yes, osmosis. Yes, water is moving, not the salt. So maybe this diagram, because I kind of jumped the gun with the isotonic, hypotonic, and hypertonic. Um, so isotonic means equilibrium, equal amounts of solutes inside, outside the cell. So water moves back and forth at equal rates. Hypotonic, water, high concentration of water outside, low inside, moves from high to low. The cell will swell, become swollen, and may rupture. And then hypertonic is concentrated. So High concentration of water here, low water out here. Water moves from high to low, it shrinks and shrivels. So if the solution is hypo, the cell in the test would be low. Mm -hmm. Okay, um, we read about aquaporins on Friday. What did you guys think about those articles? I mean, A, A, the last one was kind of ugly. It was just really confusing. Okay. We're going back. I'll be happy to help you out with that. Okay. I really like the first two articles just because. Yeah, those ones were. Yeah, and then, then the gall fly was just like, oh my god, this one is this. Okay, so aquaporins are water channels, okay? And they were probably discovered 10, 15 years ago. Um, but basically, it's just it allows water to move in and out very quickly. Specialized water channels, they've analyzed the structure of these aquaporins. There's a positively charged center, which kind of helps attract water molecules to come in and flow on through. If it's attracting, then you think it would only get in and it wouldn't really get out and it would be attracting. Yeah, but the, ox the um, hydrogens are positive, so then they repel. So it's like attracts and it pushes it away. Okay, moving on to osmotic. Pressure, so looking at cells in hypotonic solutions and hypertonic solutions. So with the hypo, that means the cell will swell and burst. Um, there's less water in the cell than outside. The cell swells. Pressure from the cell cytoplasm pushes out against the cell membrane. So as a result, your hydrostatic pressure increases. And then there is a point where the cell can't hold it. Like it will you know, go past the, the max hydrostatic pressure and may rupture. The amount of water that enters the cell depends on the difference of the solute concentration. The whole goal is to reach equilibrium, but sometimes it can just go past that. If the membrane is strong enough, the cell will reach that equilibrium. However, if it's not, the cell will burst. Um, 
Um, with plants, you see this a lot when plants wilt. Okay, they're, they've lost water in their central vacuole, um, and the, everything kind of just like collapses a little bit. But then when you water the plant, well, then they absorb that water again and become a little bit more turgid or, um, but you know, cell walls keep the cell from rupturing. So there's that support. So it's really hard to burst plant cells versus an animal cell. That's because we have multiple vacuoles. Yeah, sure. but our we don't have a cell wall. That's why it's easier to burst our cells. That's what so I was trying easier to, to burst our cells. Yes. Okay. See, <laughs> prokaryotes, remember they have cell walls. What are their cell walls so made up of? Structure in their cell. Chitin. Not chitin. No, well, no. Cellulose. cellulose. That's plants. Starch. Oh wait, we're talking about us. No, I'm talking about prokaryotes, bacteria. That's sugar. Oh, that's not in there. Oh, you guys are naming off macromolecules. This must be a rough Monday. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty rough. It's well, pretty you guys need to know what the bacteria hours. cell walls are made up of. Guaranteed. Nobody knows? Nobody remembers? Oh, I thought for sure it was the old stuff. You talk about gram positive and gram negative? I remember. Well, oh, I remember that one's purple and one's positive is purple and the negative is pink. Wait, what's that for? <laughs> the positive That's for measuring their, uh, okay, so I think that's the one. So we're trying to name what cell walls are supposed to be Yeah. See, we made you think we were smart on the first exam. <laughs> <laughs> All right, give us a hint. Or just what's tell It's made of, it's made of protein and carbs. <laughs> oh, I remember learning about, I remember the yeah, diagram, something. they had the big, Brown part. Yeah. The big oh, thick now one. you remember the picture. Yeah, I remember the picture. I don't remember what it's called. Uh, we are yeah, getting closer. Thick one, and then it's got the bulletin and oh. it's in these little parts. Oh. I feel like this exam is supposed to be rough. I don't see I didn't think it was gonna be until this question. <laughs> well, I better go look it up now that you're well, I'm looking her up. What was the thing about the positive and negative again? You were talking about like when you did the looking at the structure of the cell wall of the bacteria. So is it one layer? Or is it multi-layered and then it has that um, oh, yeah. matrix so on the outside? What? Glycogen. Oh, yeah. I have a So we had yeah. glycogen. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. I remember talking about that. Wait, it's when the... it has multiple layers, Wait. that's the negative. Yep. Because, yeah, they're like harder. A negative is pink. Never mind, it's peptidoglycin. Oh. I know what you were saying. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I read it. I butchered the reading on it. Peptidoglycin. <laughs> So then, uh, yeah, so that's prokaryotes. Fungi have what kind of cell wall? Yeah. Oh, chitin. Chitin, yeah. okay, and then plants have cellulose. So, yeah, so. So it's prokaryotes. Okay, so a video of red blood cells is loaded. Whoa. Yes. Ray's probably got a block. This guy's really exploding. <laughs> I don't think there's any questions. So isotonic, it should, it should stay the same. So it says down here, what kind of solution? Or just an egg cup. Oh, <coughs> for top. So I guess it should shrivel. It's shriveled. You can read it. So it's like it's not this round and round. Now going back, it should become a little plump. <laughs> so distilled water means hypotonic. So you can see that we actually just lost some. Oh, we're gone. Oh, that oh, one's oh, blue. Oh, oh, that one's oh, oh, it's like confetti. It's messy. Oh, oh. oh. they're all going. Oh, that one. Yeah. <laughs> that one like looks like it's still like it's fading. It just looks like the. Yeah. So ways that cells can maintain osmotic balance. Um, in some single-celled eukaryotics, they practice something called extrusion, where they actually have contractile vacuoles that um, collect water from various parts of the cytoplasm and then kind of release it to the outside of the cell so they don't like, explode. Um, they contract rhythmically. There's like, it's kind of like a pump, and there's a pore interface, and it just kind of releases that water. So, yeah, over here, water enters through to, to uh, osmosis. 
this vacuole collects the excess, uh, it swells, and then when it gets big enough, releases it and repeats. So that's a single cell eukaryote? Yes. So, I like, thought, I thought some all codes. eukaryotes had multiple. What was it? Codus. Oh, Codus. Yeah, yeah. Right. Codus or eukarya. Uh, but most yeah. of them are single cell. How is that? Oh. Remember, to be eukaryotic, you just need a nucleus and some organelles. Okay. Okay, other ways to maintain this osmotic balance. Um, isoosmotic regulation happens in aquatic or oceanic creatures. They just like, adjust the, the solute concentrations in them to match the seawater. Um, so there's really just no net flow of water inside and out very easily. With plants, it's, oh, I think there's supposed to be an R here, a turner. Plants are hypertonic due to the central vacuole, resulting in hydrostatic pressure called turgor pressure. Yeah, it's supposed to be turgor. Um, and it just makes the cell more rigid, so it leaves the central vacuole flecked in the water, and then it just relies on the cell wall to keep it from bursting. Okay, so that was all, those are all examples of passive transport, no energy required. This section deals with energy, like you need energy to move things. And the reason why is you're moving usually from low, low concentrations to high concentrations. So um, you're climbing back up the hill to go sledding. So you're going to, you have to, you know, use energy uh, to get to the top of the hill. You're moving from low to high. Okay, so active transport moves substances against the concentration gradient. It does require energy, usually in the form of ATP. So here I have a proton or a protein channel, and we have low concentration to high concentration. I'm going to use some energy to move this ion across. So we're moving against the concentra uh, concentration gradient. Um, that's active. Yes, that's active. So what happens is we usually have protein carriers involved. Um, that could be moving ions. It could be moving sugars or amino acids or even nucleotides. There are three different types of uh, protein carriers, mm -hmm. uniports, symports, and antiports. So with the uniporters, it's just a single type of molecule. Symporter means it moves two molecules in the same direction. And then antiporter means one comes in, one comes out, but it's two molecules, uh, usually two different molecules, moving in opposite directions. So a diagram to show the three, uniport, one substrate, Symport uh, two, but they're moving in the same direction, and then antiport two different substances moving in opposite directions. And then down here it got cut off, but that just means co-transport salts. So why is active transport important? Well, you can take on additional molecules already present in the cytoplasm with high concentrations versus the extracellular fluid. And so you basically you can move substances out of the cytoplasm and into this extracellular fluid, despite the higher <coughs> concentrations. Um, this is where it gets kind of messy. Sometimes to do this, you know, you need energy, but it can be direct, where you actually see the ATP molecule bind to the channel, or ATP is used in a different process, and then as a byproduct, it allows these things to move. So that's what it means by direct or indirect. So one example of a, a direct active transport method is the sodium-potassium pump. So more than one-third of all energy used for active transport is the movement of sodium and potassium ions. Um, and the reason for that, well, especially for us, we use sodium-potassium pumps in our nervous system. This is how neurons send impulses. Um, so inside the cell, you have low sodium concentration and high potassium concentration. It is maintained by the sodium-potassium pumps. Um, so question for you. It says sodium moves out, potassium moves in. Is this uniport, symport, or antiport? Anti. 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 One's leaving, the other one's coming in. They're coming in, or they're, they're moving at the same time. So sodium potassium pumps carry a protein that uses energy, stored in ATP to move these ions. So this is a diagram of a cell membrane. It's kind of cartoonish here. This is the um, sodium potassium pump, if you will. Here's ATP binds directly to it. And then as a result, it will undergo a conformation change, um, bring sodium out, bring potassium in. 
and it's moving ions against their concentration gradient. So every time I say against, I'm talking about low to high. I do have step by step of how this happens. So the first things first is that sodium binds to the cytoplasmic side of the protein, and then it undergoes <coughs> conformation change. So maybe I should, no, I have videos that show this, so we're okay. Protein binds to the ATP, cleaves a phosphate to form ADP plus the phosphate. ADP is released, but the phosphate remains linked to that protein. We call that protein phosphorylated. So I'm going to jump ahead and show you this. Here's my three sodium ions. They bind to the sodium potassium pump. Here comes ATP. The phosphate is cleaved, but it still is attached. Like one phosphate is still attached. Here's my ADP. Uh, notice that we kind of have a conformation or a, a change in the protein channel. So before it was open like this, and now it's like this. Back to step three. Phosphorylation induces a second conformation change that moves the three sodium ions across the membrane, basically out of the cell, and then they dissociate and diffuse into that extracellular solution. New conformation change has high affinity for potassium, so then potassium comes in, two of them, and they bind to the ECF side of the protein. So I'm going to jump ahead. A little P in the bottom right corner stands for what? This? Yeah. Phosphate. So this is phosphorylation. Remember, ATP is three phosphates bond together. They cleave the last one to get energy. So now, here's the sodium ions. They leave. Potassium, two of them come in and bind. And then as a result, another conformation change or uh, change of the shape of the potassium pump, sodium potassium pump, allows it to open like this. And now my potassium comes in. This phosphate is released. This phosphate will most likely float onto mitochondria to create ATP. Same thing, went back to the mitochondria because now, it, just left. right, so it's probably going to go find an ATP synthase because we haven't talked about that yet, but ATP synthase takes ADP plus P and smacks it together to turn it to ATP. Okay, so potassium binding causes another change, result in a hydrolysis of the bound phosphate group. It means it's released, causes the protein to revert back to its original shape, Exposing the two uh, potassium ions to the cytoplasm, and then the process repeats. So here's that diagram. Here's a video that shows it happening. Oh, and I think this one's got <laughs> The sodium-potassium pump is an active transport mechanism. Three sodium ions bind to the protein channel, and an ATP provides the energy to change the shape of the channel that in turn drives the ions through the channel. One phosphate group from the ATP remains bound with the channel. The sodium ions are released on the other side of the membrane outside of the cell, and the new shape of the channel has a high affinity for potassium ions and two of these ions now bind to the channel. This binding again causes a change in the shape of the protein channel, and this conformational change releases the phosphate group on the cytoplasm side. This release allows the channel to revert to its original shape, and as a result, the potassium ions are released inside the cell. In its original shape, the channel has a high affinity for sodium ions, and when these ions bind again, they initiate another cycle. The important characteristic of this pump is that both sodium and potassium ions are moving from areas of low concentration to areas of high concentration. That is to say, each ion is moving against its concentration gradient. This type of movement can only be achieved by the constant expenditure of ATP energy. What's the best juice? <clears throat> What's the food that has the most ATP? You can get a lot of energy. <laughs> what? Is it? what? I did it. Oh. Is that hurt? <laughs> no. I was pretty sure that wasn't what it was, but I just was curious. <laughs>
分别是用一份自己的，自己的家里的，嗯，哎，再把手机留起来是吧？好，那没了。拜拜。再录一次。Right, yeah, it's like phone directly. Yeah. Yes. Eat food to make ATP and directly. All right, the process of this channel. So I know that video shows it as like kind of slow. It's actually really fast. 300 sodium ions needed per second. Okay, so it's like. Does it actually do three at a time or is that. Like yeah, it does three at a time. So it doesn't play this. Yeah, so it opens and closes. So it's just like this. Hundred times. Well, yeah, it yeah. opens to allow the sodium to leave a hundred times and then it closes a hundred times. So it works. Depending on the temperature, the two are going to be Okay. Talking about one example of how ATP is released indirectly. Um, so in this case, it's a coupled transport. Energy is released as one molecule moves down the concentration gradient, captured, and used with a different molecule against the concentration gradient. So here, uh, we're going to look at a co-transporter and a proton pump. So a proton pump just pumps hydrogen ions from, um, in this case, low to high. So they're going to need to use energy. But then as a result, we use this hydrogen ion to move sucrose across indirectly. So like to get hydrogen out, we use ATP. But if we're just looking at this co-transporter, which, by the way, is sucrose and hydrogen moving in. So mm -hmm. what kind of um, transport is that? Is that UD, SIM, oh, or SIM? SIM, SIM, because they're moving in the same direction. Sucrose and hydrogen moving across in the same direction. But how did that hydrogen ion get there? Well, we had to use a different protein channel that used ATP. So this is an example of indirectly when you're looking at sucrose. Questions on that? So the first one is just the uni. Yep, this is the uni with yep. With and the next one is the sim. So it right. But just go back around again. Yes. Yeah, so then this hydrogen is <laughs> back. It's like woohoo! I'm back. Round <laughs> and then around. More energy is used. Okay. So this one again is looking at glucose. Um, another example. Glucose, obviously, a very important molecule. It's, it has many different transporters, not just the one I showed you, because sucrose is a monomer of um, a carb. But especially in the intestines, intestinal epithelial cells have high glucose concentration outside and inside, so we need to pump it against the concentration gradient, and this requires energy. So in this diagram, we have the inside of the intestine and the outside, and here's the epithelial cells and just tight junks, junctions, so glucose um, can't you know, flow through easily with the fusion reaction. Glucose is way too big, so it has to use a sim port that's driven by sodium to get inside, and then to um, to leave. Active transport uses sodium uh, concentration gradients, that sodium potassium pump, as a source of energy to power glucose into the cell. So here's my sodium potassium pump, where two sodium ions leave, and then, sorry, three sodium ions leave, and two potassium come in. But as a result, that sodium will be used as a sympore with glucose to come back in, and then the whole process repeats. So very similar to the hydrogen pump in sucrose, but just looking at sodium. So again, this co-transport, what example is it? Sim. Okay, if you think that you have it down, I think this slide's probably the most confusing. Um, yeah, so not only do we have co-transports, but we actually have counter-transports, which means you're going to move sodium in. It's coupled with an outward movement of another substance, maybe like calcium or hydrogen ion or a proton in that case. So both sodium and the other substance bind to the same transport protein. Or, yeah, And sodium comes in, and we'll say, in this case, calcium leaves. So now this is an anti-porter, but then over here, sodium leaves and potassium comes in. So, so this would be, this is actually a uni, but this is the counter transport. So on the ones that have like... Wait, the, where are you saying uni? The, here? the sodium coming out, or, or, the, or the sodium coming in. Like this coming out, 
Okay. Is that actually an anti, or is it just? Well, look, it's coupled with potassium, <clears throat> so then. So it is an anti. It's an anti. Oh, okay. Um, and really, everything's basically an anti. I know, and I don't know why they say this is a counter transport, but it's like, oh, you're moving <clears throat> sodium in, but then you're moving it back out, so it's a counter transport. Wasn't well, that the same as like the couple oh, thing with the exactly? Hydrogen? So it's like, why give it an inter? That's why so I hate this slide. So the difference between counter is it has sodium going in and sodium going out, and then coupled it's hydrogen. Okay, <coughs> last section, I believe, uh, deals with endo and exocytosis. So endo means oh, typo. Endo and endo. endo. Yeah, this must be exo. Whoops. <sighs> Anyways, <clears throat> question for you. If a cell always did endocytosis and never exocytosis, what would happen to the shape of the cell? It would get big. It would get big. Because it's too big. It would probably just... Actually, would it get big? <coughs> no, it gets small. It would get small. Huh? Oh, wait, endo goes out. Oh, no. Endo comes in, yeah. but remember, it forms that vesicle, so you lose phospholipids every time it forms a vesicle around to bring it in. Oh. And then with so X. To exo, it would make it big. Right, exo would make it big. There'd be so many phospholipids. Mm -hmm, yep, So because each vesicle would like morph with the plasma membrane, and it would just keep getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Oh, I got you. Okay, you got it now? It's small. So, endo and exocytosis are used to transport things that are big, okay? The lipid nature of plasma membrane raises a problem in order for cells to grow. You need large polar molecules that cannot cross this hydrophobic barrier. So how are you going to get those molecules? Usually endocytosis. So bulk material gets packaged into a vesicle. So with endocytosis, the plasma membrane forms around the substance you want to bring in, form in that vesicle. We usually call it phagocytosis if it's a solid. If it's taken in um, solutes or ions, dissolved substances, we call it phenocytosis because it's a cell drinking. And then we actually have some cases where there are receptors on the outside that bind to specific substrates, and then it kind of sets a trap where it's like as soon as this binds and then like all these are filled, it like spring traps and forms a vesicle to bring it in. So phagocytosis if it's solid, phenocytosis. If it's a liquid. And then the last one is the receptor mediated endocytosis. So I'm going to talk a little bit about the receptor mediated uh, endocytosis here. We have receptor molecules on the outside. They trap um, the substrate that binds to it. And it's located usually in a slightly indated pit coat of clathrin. This is really important. Clathrin is a molecule that is responsible for the spring. When target molecules bind to the receptor protein, clathrin acts like a mouse trap, snaps uh, molecules over themselves, form in that vesicle. It's very fast, very specific, yeah, and it carries the cargo in over. Josh, please let me hear the staff part about past reads at 11 o'clock today in the auditorium. Students interested in taking snowmobile safety class need to sign up in the community at office by October 17th. Eighth grade junior high volleyball will practice at 3.30 today. Prior to the seventh grade mm -hmm. game versus CGB. Reminder that they will be here to give push ups on Friday. Please bring your sign forms to the office by Wednesday. Juniors will do ASVAB interpretation tomorrow at 9 30 in the computer lab. And a rep from MSUM will be here on Wednesday at 2 30 in the Commons. Please sign up outside the office if you would like to visit us. Thank you. Okay, so this diagram uh, is depicting this clathrin mediated you know, receptor process. Here are my receptors, and in this case, clathrin coated. So then once they bind, mouse trap spring, causing it to fold in on itself and brings the vesicle in. The cool thing is this clathrin's reusable. So then once the vesicle is formed and it's inside the cell, clathrin is released and it goes back to the plasma membrane to set up another trap. And then the fate of this vesicle kind of depends on what it has. Does it go to the lysosomes? Does it go to the Golgi apparatus? Does it get, um, you know, whatever the fate is, gets carried out, but then the vesicle usually morphs back uh, to the plasma membrane and, and it's like recycled. So one example of a receptor mediated endocytosis is cholesterol. So maybe you've heard some older people talk about their LDLs or their HDLs. 
okay? So this is this is what they're talking about. They're looking at low density lipoproteins. Actually, you can probably talk to Mr. Tauber about this and give you a story. But LDLs bring yeah, cholesterol okay. into the cell where it's packed into the membranes. And so in a disease called hypercholesterolema, I hope I almost had it, um, LDL receptors lack the tails, so they never fasten to the clathrin. And as a result, the vesicles never like form. They just there's no spring trap. Cholesterol stays in the bloodstream, and as a result, you get plaques that form, and then you probably lead into a heart attack down the road. So people that suffer from high cholesterol, they probably have something wrong with their clathrin. Um, it will cause problems. Okay, endo, uh, sorry, exocytosis means materials leave the cell. Um, this is very important in plants. You need to export materials to build your cell wall. In animals, it's a way to secrete hormones. Uh, during the nervous system, neurotransmitters, digestive enzymes, and other substances, but it leaves the Golgi apparatus, and then the vesicle just morphs with the cell releasing the contents um, outside to the extracellular matrix, to the extracellular fluid. But that's it for chapter five, part two. So I guess tomorrow I'm going to lecture chapter six, part one. Wednesday I'm lecturing chapter six, part one. Thursday, Friday, and Monday will be lab days. Yeah. Yeah. Um, it, it just takes.